greetings of peace uh, to all the audience of the um, Indigo Firmament program. Uh, we welcome you uh, back once again. Uh, I'm continuing the um, subject of peace. Um, in a way, I'm trying to build up towards the World Peace Day, which is September 21st. Uh, that is celebrated worldwide. However, uh, world peace is uh, nothing but a formality and a kind of ritual. Uh, but uh, in a sense, if we can just uh, poke fun at uh, um, a little bit, uh, I think, um, uh, poking fun at the concept of if out of 365 days in a year, we have only one day for peace, then obviously the rest of them, 364 days, are the days of war. And essentially that's uh, what they are. And in, the, in this program and in the subsequent programs, I will present more reasons as to why um, violence, war, and gun is devastating the human culture in this 21st century when we claim to have become a civilized society, when we claim modernity, when we claim democracy and all the other lofty names that ought to, out of necessity, have the virtues they claim in other words, if we are a civil society, why do we behave so violently? That is a paradox. If we desire peace, then why are we uh, so gang ho on, on war and, uh, and, and, and crime? If we claim to be a democracy and a beacon of democracy and an exporter of democracy, then how is it that the rest of the world, especially the third world and the most vulnerable, vulnerable societies, uh, suffer more from our other exports, which is not democracy, but weapons, weapons of mass destruction, as well as weapons of um, uh, for individual use uh, weapons um, in the coffers of governments and weapons that are used by individual groups uh, with, with questionable identities. Um, and in a sense, we are perpetrating more violence on the world as much as, of course, we do it here in the United States. And I'm speaking um, from an American perspective and as a resident uh, and citizen of this country, I feel uh, I, as most of you have, a moral responsibility uh, to pinpoint um, uh, these um, uh, problems because we have some say in the formation of our governments as responsible citizens. It's our duty. Um, here, uh, critique and dissent is part of our patriotism. Um, and so therefore, I'm um, trying to use this stage, this mic, this video, this screen uh, to uh, share with the audience the perspectives on violence that defines our society, uh, one, one that has, for the most part, been ignored, practically speaking. Um, so I'm going to start a, a quick review of a blog I uh, published uh, in the Huffington Post some years ago. Uh, and that is only as a platform for the rest of the argument that I'm going to be building uh, on. So while part of this um, may appear to be dated in terms of the data, but uh, unfortunately, the arguments uh, still stand. Uh, the principles 
upon which I'm trying to present this thesis is still valid and humanity continues to suffer from uh, organized crime uh, under various titles and labels. The blog that uh, I wrote uh, is uh, titled, Is American Gun Culture Compatible with a Modern Civil Society? Uh, and uh, the reason I'm, I'm focusing on um, the American gun culture is because this I'm using this as a springboard for further arguments in the subsequent programs as to how this has equally contributed to the increase of violence in other societies around the world. Now, um, this is not sloganeering, and this is not, uh, and I'm not a politician. Uh, I do not have a political agenda. I have an agenda for humanity, for the improvement of the human lot. Uh, my analysis as a professor is that they are analysis um, based on sources, on data, uh, and uh, the information I'm presenting is well researched. And so therefore, do not perceive this as a, either a propaganda or an ideological bent that it may have, but not because I'm ideological, not necessarily in this context, but that um, the world is suffering uh, greatly from all the wars that are perpetrated upon the human society, uh, regardless of who starts it, who is fighting back, who's on the right side and who's on the wrong side. Uh, war is wrong by itself. It does not need to have sides war itself is on the wrong side. The human soul that suffers is on the right side. And I hope to present that side, which is ignored. The American culture is defined by the, uh, in the context that we are talking about here is, it's defined by the highest rate of gun ownership uh, that Americans own a whopping 270 million guns. Now, like I said, this data is dated uh, back from, uh, I think, 2012 or so. 270 million guns, and I'm sure that number has increased. but. Uh, at that rate, percentage-wise, um, it means that 88.8 um, .8 guns are owned by every 100 people in America. So uh, the gun ownership is out of every 100 American citizens, 88.8 .8 of them own guns. And like I said, um, in, in the intervening years, uh, those numbers have increased. So I'm sure that that number has gone upwards above 90%. Uh, <coughs> so if 90% of um, Americans own guns, that's uh, 9 out of 10, uh, that literally basically means all our citizens own guns. The reason I'm using the word all is that then in addition to this, we have our soldiers, we have our um, uh, police forces that are heavily militarized and they're all armed. We have uh, security guards in many places that are um, also armed, um, armed response teams of various kinds. And so, uh, therefore, while the citizens might be about 90% armed, um, uh, officials, people with, uh, with formal duties and responsibilities are also armed. In other words, um, we Americans have an attitude of solving every problem with a gun. Uh, the gunpoint is a solution. 
uh, yes, it may be labeled as law enforcement, uh, as security, and various other politically correct terminologies. But the bottom line is that it amounts to nothing but uh, gun ownership, and the ownership obviously entails the use of that, uh, and uh, the rest uh, we can imagine. Now, uh, to look at how, um, how lopsided that number is, not that more than 90% of American people are, are uh, armed, but to compare that with the rest of the world, uh, you also have to look at the total population of the United States, which is only 4% of the world population. So Americans constitute 4% of the world population, but they own 42% um, uh, of all the guns in the world that are uh, obtained and kept by citizens. Now, in, in the whole world, again, in according to the statistics I have, which is probably back from uh, 2012, uh, 644 million guns are owned by citizens. And of those 644 million Americans own uh, Forty-two percent. That's almost half of that. Um, now, the other two countries that follow the United States are India and China. And um, so, those two countries have a combined population that is more than seven times that of the United States. But in terms of gun ownership, they are a, a distant second and third place, with uh, forty-six million in um, India and 40 million guns in China. Uh, compare that to that of the United States, it's uh, uh, an unbelievable number. Now, um, according to a recent study, 21.7 um, uh, out of every 100,000 residents, uh, residents of the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., are killed by guns uh, that have earned uh, Washington the distinction of the murder capital of the world. Um, so again, that is a very uh, bleak number, which is 21.7 um, out of every 100,000 residents. Um, the picture is equally bleak. Um, in, in the southern states, uh, in uh, uh, Louisiana and uh, um, Alabama and uh, uh, the other deep south states. Um, we can also look at the cases of uh, uh, incidents that we had uh, recently, that of mass murder. Uh, the earlier ones were in Aurora. Uh, Virginia Tech and uh, Columbine that I have referenced in the blog. However, there were uh, many others in more recent times. Uh, these are but small uh, blips on the radar screen of gun violence in America. A report by the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control shows that there were 52,000 over 52,000 deliberate and over 23,000 accidental non-fatal gunshot injuries in the United States during uh, 2000, the year 2000. Again, uh, this is a dated um, data from uh, 16 years ago. Uh, but to take those two numbers by themselves, uh, 52,000 and 23,000, uh, accidental. Now, uh, here we are not even talking about the element of crime, uh, the motive, uh, or uh, any other uh, kind of a linkage or connection uh, that might speak of a criminal mind resorting to the use of violence. 
rather these are either deliberate or accidental um, deaths that are caused by guns. In other words, the mere presence of guns result in violence, in the loss of life, in uh, accidental or non-fatal non gunshot injuries and, and so on. Um, now, compared to the uh, OECD, that is for, uh, for Europe, of course, and the United States, uh, the United States appears to be an unusually violent country. Uh, and according to the latest Duke University study uh, by uh, Kieran Haley, uh, again, the, uh, the difference is so drastic that if we at any point are able to get uh, through, through our technical problem and show the slides, uh, you could see how different that is. So um, let's see if we can go to slide number one to just have a quick review of um, the numbers I just spoke about because sometimes um, uh, images and slides show a lot better um, or, or kind of um, transmit the point of view a lot better than otherwise. Uh, can we go to slide number one, please? Now, uh, when you look at uh, this slide, uh, you see that the, uh, uh, the color-coded indication here. Um, in uh, the darkest um, area here, which is the United States here, the gun ownership per 100 people is uh, 70 to 100. And uh, as you can see in the map, the United States qualifies for that. Um, uh, as the only country around the world. Uh, we are just totally, totally out of the range of comparison. Uh, in uh, the second shade of the color, I think Yemen comes close to that, uh, 50 to 70 percent. This might uh, have to do with either uh, the degree of violence, that is political violence and the civil war conditions, but they, even in the case of civil war, do not have as many weapons as we do. Uh, also, the fact that in, in Yemen, sometimes people carry weapons uh, as a, a kind of as an ornament uh, to show their chivalry and uh, quote-unquote manlyhood. Uh, then we have the uh, dark blue color, which again uh, occupies most of the Western world, uh, Canada, Germany, France, the Scandinavian countries, uh, Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia. And here again, uh, 30 to 50 percent of the people uh, own guns. Um, you could um, excuse Afghanistan for uh, having so many guns because of the you know, perpetual civil war and uh, invasions that have been going on and the arming of different factions by Foreign, foreign powers, but then when you look at it, uh, and the same could be said about Iraq, which falls in this category, uh, but um, uh, one could say, well, what's the excuse for um, Norway and Sweden and uh, Germany and France and Canada? Uh, again, I'm saying that perhaps this hints to uh, kind of a, a cultural trend of uh, people being more of a warrior cultural mentality. The next category below that is the um, green color, and here the gun ownership is 10 to 30 percent or 10 to 30 per 100 people. And those are uh, uh, countries like uh, Mexico, uh, Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia, where, of course, the narcotics may, have, may play a role. And then also countries like uh, uh, Pakistan, Libya, and uh, uh, some uh, South African countries and, uh, and Australia, uh, which is a very high category. Now, the lowest degree of gun ownership, that is from um, 0 0.1 to 10, happens to be in the former communist countries. Um, uh, those are the light green colors, as you can see in the map. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, India and a, a large uh, a chunk of Africa, and uh, 
here is where you can see that yes, uh, communism may have been bad. It may not have given us all the civil liberties and the society was um, controlled from above and a one party system. You can blame a lot of things on communism, but you can't deny the fact that uh, at some degree perhaps that social control contributed to the uh, preservation of life and of having uh, rather fewer casualties. Let me also, uh, let's go now to slide number two. And this is the one that uh, shows the gun ownership the, in the United States. Uh, again, uh, when you look at these numbers, these are the numbers of deaths due to injury by firearms per 100,000 population. This is a uh, map is from 2007 and as you can see again somehow there is a correlation between uh, poverty um, and, uh, and, and gun ownership. Uh, Louisiana is one of the uh, poorest states in the United States and it has the highest number of guns there. Uh, one wonders whether they would be better off uh, selling off the guns and buying food or uh, uh, investing that money in health and education and welfare and other things. And the adjacent states of Arkansas, um, Missouri, uh, sorry, um, Mississippi and Alabama, uh, as well as the cities, uh, the states that are bordering on Mexico, Arizona, and uh, then of course the adjacent state of Nevada, those are states that have a lot of guns. And then you could also see for the rest of it that um, basically it's the southern part of the United States, and I'm not talking about the deep south, but basically the entire s half of the south. Then you could also uh, extrapolate from this and um, uh, explain that through a correlation between uh, conservatism, perhaps, or religiosity, the Bible Belt, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the north, as much as it's liberal, uh, if you look at that whole um, light blue in Massachusetts and Connecticut and Rhode Island and New York, and for some reason Iowa has qualified for that too, that's where there is very little um, gun ownership. Uh, so in a way, um, the people who tend to have guns also um, seem to have certain kinds of uh, political or perhaps religious insecurities. Let's go to slide number three. And this is basically the same slide um, as slide number two, except it shows certain states with um, uh, uh, kind of a limited uh, gun control laws that are highlighted here in the blue. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it's, uh, it's the same map as the one we saw before. Um, the um, uh, slide number four will be our next one. And this is the one where we're primarily comparing uh, the United States and um, uh, the European Union. If, if we can uh, see the, the drastic difference that all the countries of the European Union are in, in the red at the bottom. And then we have the United States way up there at the top. And this trend is from 1960 to uh, 2010. And uh, the only reason I can think of the decline in this uh, curve is perhaps due to the ratio as the population increased, the percentage may fall, but nonetheless it's still pretty high. So in the 1980s, um, 70s and 80s, in the United States, the gun ownership was well above 95 uh, percent. and that makes like um, basically every citizen uh, of the country an, an, ar an armed uh, citizen, which is very unfortunate. So um, w the argument that uh, I'm making is that yes, there is a direct correlation between the mindset of the person who resorts to the use of gun. Um, and then, of course, the use of that gun either deliberately or accidentally. 
and the number of deaths that, uh, that they cause. Um, that, in my opinion, is not compatible with the civil society. Um, we can uh, then go to the next argument here. And I, I think we um, are, are done with the slides, at least for now. Um, that why is this happening? Uh, it's happening because um, gun ownership has become part of an ideology in the United States. Um, we uh, have the National Rifle Association, um, who are in a way a mouthpiece for the um, weapon manufacturers and uh, they are the ones who advocate gun ownership and defend uh, that position as an al uh, inalienable right of every American citizen uh, who are um, entitled to gun ownership. Um, so if uh, we can close the slides perhaps at this point. Um, so the, the gun lobby, as I said, is representing uh, gun manufacturers, and the, uh, they deceive the public into thinking that gun ownership prevents violence. Um, and the common scenario presented is that um, what if an armed assailant broke into your house in the middle of the night? Uh, that is the, the common assumption. Um, uh, and can we close the slide, please? We, we don't need the slide anymore. Thank you. Now, um, uh, at this point, uh, let's let's assess that claim. What if an armed assailant broke into your house in the middle of the night? And so, in a way, this is fear mongering, but it's based on the wrong and unrealistic premise for the following reason. Number one, if you have a gun at home for such a possibility, when the, when the armed assailant is walking into your house, breaking into your house, that person's finger is on the trigger. That person's gun is loaded. That person has already de decided to shoot at anyone who would resist. You may have a gun, but most likely it's not loaded. Because if it's loaded, it poses danger to members of the family, especially the children. Um, and in the event that it is loaded, uh, at the time that the assailant breaks into your house, you're probably asleep. And by the time you do a kind of reality check to see what happened, um, you will be taken over by fear. So the element of fright itself is such that you may not be in the best state of mind to locate where your gun is, and you may not know um, whether to use it or not because you don't know what is happening until that adjustment in the state of mind is taking place. In other words, you might have you might have woken up physically, but your mind might still be in the may may still need some some adjustment. Uh, and it might be dark, and you may not know who the person is, and you could accidentally hurt someone, some of your family members, or all those uh, things. Now. In, in, in gun violence, or rather in gun use, uh, the difference is not of a minute or two or three, but the difference is one of a second or more accurately fractions of a second. So in that fraction of a second, when the armed assailant that has broken into your house, God forbid, his finger is on the, and it's probably uh, his instead of her, so his finger is probably on the trigger, ready to shoot. Why? Because number one, he has nothing to lose. If anything or anyone gets hurt, 
they will get hurt in your house, not in his. So he is going to be much more free and trigger happy to uh, to shoot, whereas you would have a, a lot of considerations because anything that gets damaged in your house is yours. Anyone who gets hurt in your house is one of yours. And, and the assailant is not going to turn on the light. And if you turn on the light, you become the target. Uh, let's look at a different uh, aspect of the same scenario that is uh, misleading and misrepresented. <clears throat> Suppose um, an armed assailant walks into your house and you have a gun versus you not having a gun. Which one increases the chance of you being shot? Obviously, if you have a gun, he has to shoot you to prevent you from shooting him. So in other words, your gun ownership guarantees you being killed. Whereas if you don't have a gun, chances are that he might ask for, for money, for jewelry, whatever he's after, without necessarily killing you. Because as a professional burglar and thief, he doesn't want to get in trouble with the law. He doesn't want to make noise. He doesn't want to, um, the, the gunshots to be heard because someone else could call the police. So if you don't have a gun, the gun, uh, the, the gun owner or the assailant, the armed assailant, has less of an incentive to shoot you than otherwise. So these are uh, the distortions uh, that are presented or more accurately misrepresented. And and, and uh, these are the ones they convince the people that yes, you have to fight for the gun ownership because it, it it will protect you. In reality, gun ownership does not protect you, but puts you in danger. Because with an armed assailant, you are a target, and there is no question that the armed assailant is going to shoot you not so much to kill you, but to prevent you from killing him. And so therefore, that scenario that uh, just, just doesn't hold water here. Um, the other way to look at it is that aside from the fact that the, the criminal always stays uh, one step ahead of the victim and one step ahead of the law enforcement, the probability of survival in a fraction of a second quick reflex decision is less than 50% at best. Um, the reason that criminals succeed in what they do is because they plan. And the reason that in most cases they can get away with it is because the police and security forces that respond, the respond is a reaction. And obviously, reaction takes place after the action has already occurred. And so they are playing a catch-up uh, game all the way through. Um, considering that a criminal can legally carry high caliber heavy guns like uh, the AR-15, for which again the NRA uh, lobbies heavily. So you may have a gun uh, that might be you know, a small gun that you bought for yourself for your own safety. Um, and I don't want to get too technical, but uh, that will be no, um, no match uh, for a heavy gun that can shoot bullets at, uh, spray bullets, you know, at, at a very high speed and, uh, um, and, and cause a whole lot of damage. So even if you were, again, for the sake of argument, ready, um, gun at hand, and, and finger at the gun trigger, and you could see each other clearly, you have no chance 
of winning over gun assailants because um, your weapons do not match. Um, there has been a, a study between um, 1987 and 1990 by, uh, by David McDowell that found that guns were used in defense during a crime incident 64,000 times annually. Uh, the number is a little over 64. Um, so uh, they were used during a crime incident, number one, that's important, that the incident was one of crime and they were used for defense 64,615 times annually. And this equates to two times out of 1,000 incidents. So in terms of percentage, that is 0.2% that guns were used for defense for the reasons that I explained to you because uh, not only would an individual whose house is being broken into, but also the police virtually play a catch up as the perpetrators are ready, armed, uh, and willing to shoot. Now, um, for violent crimes, assault, robbery, rape, guns were used 0.83% of the time in self-defense. So again, the argument of the uh, National Rifle Association does not hold water. So for all the crimes that I listed, assault, robbery, rape, um, and other violent crimes, uh, guns were used uh, for, for defense 0.83%. That is not even 1%. And for the other crimes that I told you, which was um, in, in, in incidences uh, of, of, uh, uh, of defense, that was 0.2%. So uh, both of these cases then indicate that the claim that you need to buy a, an arm, uh, you know, guns or weapons, whatever, um, to defend yourself based on what actually occurs um, that, that, uh, that may be a kind of a self-deception more than anything. Now, equally flawed is the argument that guns don't kill. And uh, here people, uh, the, the argument that the NRA and sometimes uh, in the public domain people have sort of bought into or have been made to think is that people kill people and guns uh, ownership uh, guns don't kill people um, in other words they are making an argument that gun ownership doesn't contribute to violence um, the uh, there has been a, a harvard injury control research center study that concluded that where there are more guns there is more homicide uh, and the reason for that is that one that the map I showed you earlier, that there is a, a close correlation between um, um, poverty perhaps and uh, perhaps a more conservative uh, viewpoint on, on issues um, that all indicate that um, uh, gun equals um, loss of life. Um, the one study that uh, I'm referring to that was done by uh, Hepburn, Lisa Hepburn, and Hemingway, David Hemingway, uh, they concluded that, uh, that in their review of the academic literature, they found out that a broad array of evidence indicates that gun availability is a risk factor for homicide, both in the United States and across high-income countries. So again, we are talking primarily um, uh, Europe and the first world. And uh, case control studies, ecological time series, and cross-sectional studies indicate that in homes, cities, states, and regions in the United States where there are more guns, both men and women are at a higher risk for homicide particularly firearm homicide. Um, 
Uh, and the, these studies have been uh, confirmed by others, uh, one that was uh, in the Journal of uh, Trauma in the year 2000. Again, uh, I, I will uh, save you the trouble of going through the details of the research, but there were uh, continuous um, studies con uh, by different organizations, and all of them reached that, that one conclusion. And in order to uh, support the argument that, uh, or rather to respond to the argument that people kill people and guns don't, the missing argument here is that the enabler element is not here. Um, yes, people kill people, but how do they kill or with what do they kill? If a person has, uh, let's say, a dagger, a sword, a knife, or some sharp object, there is no way that that person, even if he is willing and his opponents are totally disarmed, they cannot kill. Uh, they cannot uh, kill on mass. The case of mass murders that that we have seen in many places in the United States. The reason is that a person with a knife would have to engage an opponent. And yes, some of his opponents might be weaker than him, so he can overpower them. But that not that is not necessarily. Uh, that may not necessarily be the case with his third and fourth victim. And again, other victims uh, or potential victims uh, may, may gang up on, on the assailant and disarm him and stop him from committing crime. And yes, it's still possible that, yes, you might get stabbed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get killed, so you might uh, um, have severe injuries. Uh, so therefore, uh, with a knife or with any other sharp object, um, and, and let's forget about sword and the dagger because carrying those around would be kind of a signaling and uh, uh, might prevent an, an insane person from committing such a crime. But the idea is that um, uh, people kill people, but people kill more with more lethal weapons. And with a gun, um, you, can, uh, you don't have to overpower someone physically. You don't have to engage someone. You don't have to get even close to a person. You can shoot them from a distance, disable them, kill them, and shoot them many times over. And, and the incidence or the occurrence of death from such violence is much, much higher. Now, we haven't even talked about the AR-15 and AK-47 and all the other machine guns um, uh, that, that have magazines that carry uh, more uh, munition. Uh, we haven't even talked about that. And unfortunately, those weapons that were designed to be for, uh, for the battlefield are now used in many of America's streets. And um, they, they are sold in gun shows and, uh, and the rest, which we don't need to get, get there. Now, the profit motive of the gun manufacturer is conveniently hidden by the gun lobby behind a misconstrued interpretation of the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. This is the heart of the whole argument I'm trying to get to is that if the evidence is so overwhelming that guns, gun ownership equals more violence, that guns kill, regardless of whether the person intended it or was it deliberate or a mistake or an accident or by design, guns kill and more powerful guns kill more and guns bought and sold in societies and cities and towns where there is no gun control m basically makes that killing, at least in terms of the instrument uh, employed in the crime, it could be a legally purchased machine gun. 
that our lawmakers have allowed because they kowtow to the gun lobby and those weapons are unleashed upon the citizens of America. And from time to time they may get a lot of publicity when they can find an assailant with a foreign sounding name, with a cultural stereotypes, uh, labeling them terrorist and this and that and the other. But the reality is that um, those few incidences uh, are, are less than 3% of the crimes committed in America, and I'm talking here about the mass murders that are basically ignored because the gun manufacturers have an incentive not to. And in fact, what happens generally is that w whenever there is a, a mass murder instance, a mass shooting in the United States, uh, gun sales uh, increase. And that is, again, uh, when we go on the basis of the profit motive, um, the, the gun owner, the gun manufacturers um, thrive on that because for them business is business. What matters is the bottom line. And what is the bottom line is their own profit. And the only way they can profit is to be able to sell more weapons to more people. To them, gun buyers are customers, if you look at it strictly on business terms. And therefore, the moral question doesn't even appear to be relevant. And that's why they have to conveniently hide um, behind the Second Amendment, that yes, you have the right to own guns. Whereas the Second Amendment is talking about uh, a militia, uh, a, an organized militia, a civilian um, a s a group of civilians that get together and try to defend the uh, lives and interests of a community. And that responsibility has been relegated to the U.S. Uh, armed forces. Um, at the time that the Second Amendment was passed, we did not have the Pentagon. We didn't have uh, the large Navy and the Air Force and the rest of it. So the 13 colonies were vulnerable to the uh, standing uh, invading armies of England and France and Spain. So then it was a necessity for people for civilians to organize and have a militia to defend themselves. Not now. So the Second Amendment is totally uh, uh, misconstrued uh, in terms of its interpretation uh, to make that a right of ownership of gun instead of the right of defense of the communities, the society in large, at large and, and the country. Uh, so in this manner, the gun lobby eclipses public opinion uh, and the concerns of the citizener, citizenry and scares into compliance uh, our political leaders uh, to stay away from enacting, even suggesting any meaningful legislation. Like I said, what sane mind would suggest that a weapon, a machine gun designed for battlefield that can shoot uh, hundreds of bullets uh, would be allowed to be sold to private citizens who may then use them uh, in, in, on the streets of America, not in the battlefields abroad. And when I'm talking about the uh, uh, politicians that buy into this is because of the power of the National Rifle Association, um, they find it very difficult to, uh, to deviate. 
and uh, I think there was a case of uh, Governor uh, Hickenlooper uh, uh, of Colorado, I think, um, and his skepticism about the effect of tougher gun law was apologetic, but this is what he said. Uh, he was referring to, I think, the Aurora case, that this person, if there were no assault weapons available, if there were no this or no that, this guy, this guy is going to find something, which is the argument I refuted early. Yes, he could find something, a sharp object, a gun, a kitchen knife or something, but that would have not resulted in, in the in the mass murder, in the mass shooting in Aurora. Um, then we, at this, again, about that same incident, there was a, uh, uh, w when he told the CNN that uh, his administration will try, and that's the key word, will try to create some checks and balances on these things. And, and most of these statements by politicians are simply to deceive the public to make them believe that they are really doing something, whereas in reality they are not. When in reality they are uh, towing the line of the National Rifle Association. And uh, again, to go to that incident, uh, President Obama missed that opportunity too. And that as the, you know, he was in a leadership position, he could do something, but we saw him uh, coming out repeatedly and um, after uh, several of these um, mass shootings that occurred under um, during his administration. Uh, and again, um, uh, it is one of ineptness, of indifference that is coded in political jargon so that people would uh, think that our politicians are doing something. But uh, what is happening in reality, uh, factually, in terms of data and numbers, is that more and more Americans um, become owners of guns, and as I said earlier, that results in more and more um, killing. We hear only of the mass killings, but uh, there is a lot more uh, than that. And uh, the, to the uh, an American politician the G word, gun, or gun control, that's, uh, that's a hot potato, uh, especially in an election year like right now, um, that, that they are um, absent from, uh, from the uh, pitch perfect speeches of, of the politicians who try to um, advocate and make promises that they will be serving us, but in reality, they are serving the gun lobbies first, and only by necessity, and only minimally, and only through a deception, they make promises that they know well that they won't be able to deliver on. Um, th this reality is born by a wild, wild west mindset that questions our commitment to democracy at home and abroad. And we may not be able to get to the abroad part of it in uh, uh, in its all all its dimensions, but yes, we will get there. Um, today, I'm I'm concentrating only on uh, again the American society, as our American gun culture evolves into a warrior culture the devastation inflicted upon the lives of Americans uh, through the brutality of the militarized police force at home often multiplies through our unbridled militarism abroad. The um, protest against the warrior mentality of the Anaheim police in California a few years back uh, is uh, another case in point. Um, that um, they killed in cold blood. Uh, we also have the um, Black Lives Matter movement that is actually uh, uh, spearheading this movement. And uh, let's hope that uh, 
that that would uh, result in something positive. Uh, let's take a break and we'll be back after a few moments. <laughs> 